What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here, and today I'm going to be talking about Jon Stewart and the videos he's been releasing over the past two days or so, um, pushing a very woke agenda, and why I don't think it's surprising, even though a lot of people seem to be surprised by it, you know, kind of saying Jon was always one of the good ones, he was one of the more rational ones on the left, and I don't agree with that, and this is coming from someone who, honestly, I used to be a big fan of Jon Stewart, um, back when I considered myself left wing, when I wasn't uh, as well informed on a lot of these topics when I was just, you know, young and naive and kind of stupid. And the reason that I'm not really surprised is because if you look back at a lot of his comedy, he always, in some ways, he, he was kind of openly left wing, but in some ways he did kind of present himself as this sort of centrist figure that, oh, that the left just always happened to be more right, um, or more correct, I should say, on these issues. Um, and this is kind of the way that a lot of left-wing figures in especially pop culture try to present themselves. They try to present themselves as neutral while clearly holding left-wing opinions, sometimes very far left-wing, very far left-wing opinions. Um, but they still try to present themselves as neutral. And some of that, I think, is because of the producers behind them trying to appeal to a larger audience. But some of that, I think, is actually a subversion tactic. Um, to get people like myself when I was younger, uh, who are naive, maybe not so aware of the political situation. They don't hear, um, for lack of a better term, to steal a word from the left. They don't understand the dog whistles. So when, you know, the, the radical left hears a lot of these jokes or a lot of the things he's saying, they know what he's talking about. When people on the right who are politically informed hear these things there, they know what he's talking about. But when people who are more apolitical or maybe just uninformed hear a lot of this stuff, they don't really know what he's talking about. And they just kind of assume what he means is what he means when a lot of these, a lot of the words and a lot of the phrases that these types of people use um, can be coded messaging to some degree. One of the most common ones, obviously, is equity. Uh, to most people who are politically unaware, equity and equality essentially mean the same thing. But obviously... That is not true, and people on both the far left kind of socialist communist end and people on the right uh, both acknowledge these are very different things, whereas people in the center and people who are, you know, generally more politically unaware kind of see these as b both the same thing, right? Whereas, you know, they're not. Uh, equality is obviously... Base, uh, essentially, when people say equality, they mean equality of opportunity. When people say equity, they mean equality of outcome, right? So people who want equality want playing field to be fair people who want equity want the end results to be even um and those are not the same thing but regardless the thing with john stewart uh and a lot of these other people colbert would be another one although he's gone i would say quite a bit more left than he used to be um he was honestly in some ways much better to some degree although obviously on the colbert report he would very often you know, he would parody a right winger. Um, but he did it in a way that I would, in some ways, he was actually better at kind of hiding his true beliefs than Jon Stewart was in some ways. Um, Jon Stewart was always obviously very left wing. And the fact that now he's got this podcast, the problem with Jon Stewart, um, it doesn't really surprise me that he's going down this woke rabbit hole for a couple of reasons. One, it's the logical conclusion to a lot of these ideas that he has, right? So a lot of what he's thinking of when he talks about, or a lot of what he's talking about um, when he would talk about these different ideas back in the day, the logical conclusion of them is essentially wokeness, right? So it isn't really that surprising this is where, you know, it's gone down. And I think this is a problem... People have a hard time differentiating between a slippery slope fallacy and a logical conclusion. Um, you know, you'll have people say, well, the logical conclusion of, of A is B, and then someone will retort by saying, no, that's a slippery slope fallacy. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. It really depends on the context of what you're saying, right? So one thing that would often be said back in the day only 10 years ago is that if gay marriage becomes socially acceptable, then the next thing you know, um, 
they'll be teaching this to kids in school. And what would often be said is, why would they need to teach this to kids in school? There's actually a meme that went viral on Reddit or viral on Twitter of a Reddit post recently. The Reddit post being from, I believe, 10 or 12 years ago. And it was a Venn diagram that said, uh, what will happen if gay rights become legal? And then it was uh, your kids being taught this in school. And it was all of it was no. Right. And it's kind of funny because nowadays one of the biggest issues is the uh, on the right call it the groomer bill, the le the anti groomer bill I should say, the left call it the don't say gay bill, which is the bill in Florida, that is essentially to not be teaching basically different sexualities and very you know stuff like that to children as young as like four or five years old in kindergarten which even 10 years ago, left-wingers, at least the ones who were um, more politically naive or at least, you know, kind of hiding what they actually wanted to do, would not think would happen or would not admit to what would happen. And it's hard to say how much of this they actually didn't see coming and how, how much of it is, for lack of a term, kind of cult behavior, right? So because this has become the new thing within their movement, how much they just kind of follow on and how much of it is because it's a logical conclusion, they just follow on. And that's why when we get to his new talks about white fragility and the problem with white people and how white people just need to shut up and listen to what people of color have to say and all this other stuff, it really shouldn't surprise anyone that this is where Jon Stewart has ended up. The left has used subversion tactics for going on 60 years now, right? Everything they've done has been subversive. Um, both when they didn't have institutional power prior to the 90s, and since they've gained that institutional power since the 90s. Um, I would divide what they've done into essentially two phases. So a lot of this obviously comes out of the new left movement that was people in the late 60s, early 70s, who at the time were graduating university, um, a lot of these radical ideas were put into place there by the Soviet Union uh, for multiple different reasons. Some of them for basically the con like a lot of it was obviously the communist movement. They wanted to indoctrinate the young ch children. I guess that, at that point, they're not children, they're young adults, but they wanted to indoctrinate the youth into a communist movement. So some of it was from a social uh, for sorry, from an economic perspective. Some of it, on the other hand, was in order to undermine Western society um, th being Western Europe because to some degree, you could argue Russia is a Western country, depending on what you mean by Western, right? Because Western's a relative term. Um, but in the, in the context of uh, the, the Cold War, Western obviously meaning the capitalist countries and not the Eastern European countries. Um, and they wanted to undermine that society. So, so a lot of that was pushing all these different um, ideologies that have kind of evolved into what's now known as intersectionalism. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, in the, to quote Jordan Peterson, uh, postmodern neo-Marxism. And it's a uh, somewhat accurate term because there is kind of this fusion of postmodernism and Marxism, uh, although it is a changed version of Marxism, which is why it's called neo-Marxism. And it's infused into like all these different theories, like critical race theory and all this stuff. And uh, if you read the history of these ideologies, there's, there's actually a couple different uh, YouTubers that actually do good videos on this. Um, I'll, I'll leave some links in the description below. But the ideological uh, chain is there, for lack of a better term, right? So, and, and the reason that a lot of people either deny or don't realize that these ideas are baked into these other ideas is because they're basically viewed as... Um, it, it's viewed as so much of the truth, right? It's like a established reality within these ideas, within these fields of, of uh, philosophy, essentially. That's basically what a lot of these, uh, a lot of these writings are in is essentially philosophy or, you know, some, some of the philosophy of law, um, a lot, especially the critical race theory stuff. A lot of it is within uh, different legal systems and such. Um, and so these different views are baked very much into the different ideologies. And when you read the books, they say, so the problem is, right, you read, say, something by, um, 
you know, it's one of these one of the critical race theory books, and there'll be no explicit um, views on Marxism, right? Nothing. They don't blatantly talk about Marxism within most of these writings. Some of them do, but most of them do not, right? But they will reference other works, and a lot of those other works are from what's of sometimes called the postmodernist school. Um, there's there's a couple different schools of thought, but a lot of them reference postmodernism, right? And when you read the postmodernists, a lot of them reference Marxism and some of the not just Marxism, but some of the different ideologies, um, such as Gramsci and philosophy, which is kind of a neo-Marxist ideology, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, a lot of these different philosophers, they realized the problems with Marxism. And there was basically two or th well, there's actually three reactions to that. There was the people who kind of left that movement and a lot of them ended up becoming the neocons, right? So, which is why there's that joke about the Trotskyite to neocon pipeline is because it's actually true. A lot of the, uh, neoconservatives, including Ronald Reagan, were originally Trotskyists. They followed a, uh, kind of Trotskyan idea. Um, and then there was some of those people who basically became the kind of postmodern school and they essentially believed that a kind of incoherent um, rationalization, for lack of a better term, that there is no truth. Truth is only for power. Um, uh, basically, you can't know anything, therefore Marxism. And if that doesn't sound like it makes sense, it really doesn't. And you should, like, you should read their literature. It really, like, what they're saying, the, the, a lot of the critiques they make are pretty accurate to some degree. Um, but the rationalizations they come out with afterward aren't, right? Uh, it's very post hoc rationalization in a lot of ways, right? So the, and I think that's the problem with a lot of these ideologies is because the critiques they make are accurate. Um, people assume that they're, uh, fixes or the solutions for these different problems are as well. And I like, that's not really true because basically they just kind of like, they'll talk about like this, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. This isn't true. This isn't true. This isn't true. Therefore Marxism. And it's like, okay, I agree with the first half of that, but how did you get to the therefore Marxism? Right. And a lot of it is because these people were Marxist realized that they had lost the philosophical battle. Couldn't cope with that because a lot of them, prided themselves on their intelligence. A lot of them made their money from their intelligence. Their entire career was based off their intelligence. And if they accepted that they were wrong, um, and not only that, but they accepted that they were wrong again, because th they had already basically lost the Nazi battle, right? Because people kind of view Nazism nowadays, especially as a right-wing movement, but if you read a lot of the literature that was coming from the left in the 20s and 30s uh, during the rise of Hitler and uh, Mussolini and their, you know, taking over of these different countries prior to World War II, the left was looking at them in a very favorable light and talking about how this was, you know, proof that these ideologies could work and that all these different left-wing ideologies with the movement of the future and then obviously of World War II. And then they kind of pushed those ideologies and said, oh, these are right-wing ideologies, even though they were claiming them before the war. Um, and then they had this, then basically they held up the Soviet Union as their new version of left-wing ideology, not entirely new version because they basically the true version for lack of a better term, but then in, you know, the fifties and sixties and seventies as basically what the reality of the Soviet Union started to become more well-known in Western countries then they had to, you know, kind of push themselves away from that. And that's when you started to get this kind of postmodernist school, um, so it is very much true that this is, you know, postmodern neo-Marxism, right? Which is because it's kind of this fusion of these different ideas into this kind of incoherent mess, which is why a lot of what they say doesn't make sense and why they'll say one thing and then 10 seconds later say, later say something that completely contradicts the thing they said before. And it really shouldn't surprise anyone that Jon Stewart has gone down this route. It is very much the logical conclusion of his ideas. Um... You know, liberalism won, but it lost. And, and the reason I say that is because, and I mean, I mean, liberalism is in the classic, classical liberal sense, right? What, which is what most conservatives are, is actually classical liberals, right? What they want to conserve is the classical liberal tradition. And I think that's the reason that a lot of people in Western societies, especially the Anglosphere, are often confused when people say liberal, because there's the liberal in the philosophical sense, which is actually a conservative ideology, because that's what 
conservatives want to conserve is classical liberalism. And then there's liberalism in the kind of colloquial sense, which is basically used as a term for left wing, right? So, um, and this isn't always true because uh, a lot of the time socialists and communists will say they're not liberal, um, which is true. They're not liberal. Um, but for the average Joe, they kind of associate anything left wing with being liberal, even if they are very illiberal ideologies. And I think that's kind of the problem. And I don't know how well the problem with John Stewart is, <laughs> you know, kind of an unintended pun because uh, that's the name of this podcast, but is that I, it's hard to tell how much he actually knows about these ideologies he's spouting off about. Um, you know, is he hiding his power level or is he just incredibly uninformed? And it's really hard to tell because he he kind of presents himself in, in simultaneously as I'm a genius, but also I'm an idiot, right? Like that's kind of his whole shtick is, and that's the shtick of a lot of these guys, which is why I think part of it is, um, you know, the kind of hide their power level type thing. Because so many of them, they a lot of them have the same strategy, right? They, and it's to present themselves as both incredibly dumb and incredibly smart at the same time, right? So they have this kind of smug arrogance that I know better than you, I am more intelligent than you, um, you know, kind of that like coastal elitism is often what it's called, um, where, you know, I'm from, <laughs> I'm from a big city, I'm from a uh, prestigious school, I'm on a network television show, and you idiots from the middle of bumfuck nowhere uh, that went to, you know, that, ha that are working as a plumber or an electrician or whatever, you don't know a fucking thing. But then at the same time, they'll present themselves as, I'm just a bumbling idiot comedian, and I don't know anything, and I'm still smart enough to understand this. And they try to play both these things at the same time. And Colbert's kind of moved away from this, but he did used to kind of present himself as this way. Um, a lot of the late night talk show guys kind of do this, right? Um, the Jimmy Kimmel's and the Jimmy Fallon's and um, Seth, uh, what's it? I can't remember Seth's last name, but you guys know who I'm talking about, the Seth guy. Um, but a lot of these late night talk show hosts, uh, aside from Conan, Conan actually seems to be the one good one. Um, but they kind of present themselves in this this kind of way too, where they pretend to both be an idiot and a genius at the same time. And it's it's hard to say who's pretending and who's not, right? Who's really that kind of smug, arrogant, um, I know better than you even though I'm an idiot, and who just does it because they realize it appeals to a large audience and that they can kind of play both ends at once for different political gain. Um, and especially because a lot of these people try to present themselves as this kind of counterculture movement, which to some degree was true in the six, from the 60s to the uh, 90s, which is why I present this as like kind of the two different divisions, as I was saying earlier. You have the 60s to the 90s where these people just kind of came out of university and they were the lower rungs of a lot of these uh, institutions. They were working their way up. Um, they had not taken over from the greatest generation and the silent generation before them. And so they did not have the political power. And you had a far more right wing uh, silent generation and greatest generation that were controlling all these institutions. Um, and then once you get to the 90s, a lot of these the greatest generation and the silent generation start dying off. A lot of the boomers and the older Gen Xers start moving into these positions of power and then they become the institutions, but they still like to pretend that they're the, they like to pretend it's 1968, 1969, you know, the summer of love and that they are still these kind of revolutionaries. They're the counterculture and it's, it's kind of hilarious because they control the majority of the universities. They control all the major networks except for Fox they control basically the entirety of the internet, right? Like if you have right-wing opinions, it's pretty easy to get banned off of most social media platforms. Um, they control the majority of 
the state apparatus, uh, what's often called the deep state, which is just, you know, the, the bureaucracy within the different governments. Um, although that is partially at the fault of right-wing parties because of their liberal ideology um, being so anti-government, they usually don't appoint people to those positions when they're in positions of power because they don't believe in those institutions to start with, and they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot there. But they basically have every major rung of power now, but they still kind of view themselves as these, you know, hippie revolutionaries from the 60s and 70s, and they still view themselves as these revolutionaries and we're the counterculture. And it's like, no, you guys are the establishment now. And especially when, you, you know, it's it's kind of funny because they control absolutely everything. Or I should say 90 to 95% of everything when it comes to Hollywood and social media and, um, you know, the different major networks and... Uh, you know, the, the bureaucracy within the government and the education systems and the unions and all of this stuff, they control almost all of it. And they still want to present themselves as these revolutionaries. And I think a lot of them to a lot, and, you know, part of that being with the CIA, which is often viewed as a, I would say to some degree, although this is less and less true now, um, it was always kind of viewed as like the CIA being this like super right wing thing. But I don't think we can say that's true since at least the 90s, maybe the 2000s, if we're lucky, the early 2000s. Because if you look at, I think it was the JFK documents when they came out, it was talking about how back in the 60s and 70s, already back then, one in six people in major news organizations at the time were CIA assets. And we know that there's at least some now today still because Anderson Cooper probably being the most prime example, um, you know, the guy's kind of, and he's another great example of somebody who tries to present themselves as kind of this like count, this revolutionary against the system. Meanwhile, he's a ex CIA employee. If you can be an ex CIA employee, right? Um, he's one of the heirs to the Vanderbilt fortune, one of the richest families in the history of the world. I think it was either his grandfather or his great grandfather. I can't remember exactly was at the time of his death, the richest man to ever live. Um, and this guy is pretending to be this like anti-establishment fight the system kind of guy because he likes to suck dick, right? So it's it's one of those things where they want, they want to, and part of that is the ideology itself because they want to feel oppressed, right? So that's that champagne socialism. You know, we got to fight the power even though we are the power and will fight for the little guy while we're holding the little guy down. And, you know, it's 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 all a justification for the power they have, which is why in some degree I kind of, a, a, to some degree I kind of agree with their view of, you know, Gramsci and philosophy, which is there is no truth but power. Because a lot of what they say is so baseless, right? But they use it as a means of control. They are so... Everything that they claim to hate is what they are to a large degree, but they claim to hate it to maintain it, right? It's kind of, in some ways, it reminds me of the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the old Christ, like the old Christians back in the Middle Ages where they would just repent for their sins over and over again and give themselves lashes in order to show how pious they were. Um, they kind of do the same thing where... They'll talk about how evil white people are, and this, you know, this, to lead into the John Stewart thing again, talk about how evil white people are and how evil capitalism is and how evil the system is, while they're white, insanely wealthy from capitalism and embedded in the system as much as you can be to the point of some of them even being CIA assets, right? They're, you know, like you you have this guy who's a white former CIA employee who works as a news anchor for one of the largest news networks in the entirety of the world. And he's pretending that he's this oppressed minority fighting the system, um, you know, smash capitalism and all this shit. And it's, it's just, you know, I've, I've kind of gone off on a little bit of a tangent here, you know, quite a bit of a tangent, but it really does not surprise me that Jon Stewart is kind of doing this. Like it's, it's the logical conclusion of everything he's been saying and doing and, um, you know, how much of it is, uh, 
him being naive and how much of it is him playing power games, how much of it is him just cashing a paycheck for somebody that wants him to play these power games for them. It's hard to say, but I'm just not surprised and I don't know why anyone else is surprised. So like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think below and I'll uh, see you in the next video.